Hopefully this time the recording will work properly. <laughs> um, and uh, <clears throat> so I just got a text message saying that instruction is going to be remote on Tuesday and Wednesday. So I, I think that means that at least through Wednesday, this course will still be on Zoom. Um, and after that, I don't know. <laughs> um, um, okay, so I'll just start talking about Hume, unless there's questions about anything like that. Okay. This Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I, I mean, Josephine is suggesting we could start meeting at a cafe, but, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I mean, I have two courses, so I'd have to sit, I would have to find a cafe that would let me set up a whiteboard and a uh, camera and lecture for uh, three hours. So, <laughs> no, I think we're going to stick with Zoom. Uh, all right. So, um, um, all right. So, okay, so um, the subject for today, obviously, is uh, Hume's theory of space. Uh, space and time, actually, although I'm mostly going to talk about space. Um, that's definitely kind of a problem. That happens in my current courses, too, but oh well, whatever. Um, and uh, before I start talking about it, I should just remind you that um, we're not sure which parts of this Hume might have changed his mind about at the time of the inquiry. It, um, it definitely, he definitely somehow completely changed his, it, well, I shouldn't say that. It definitely seems like he somehow completely changed his mind about geometry between the treatise and the inquiry, but he doesn't. There's, there isn't really a systematic treatment of geometry in the inquiry or the other later works. So, uh, um, so it's not 100% clear, but uh, it seems like some of the things he says here, at least he took his, he, he would have taken back later. Um, but um, it doesn't matter because they're interesting. Um, uh, in fact, I think it's really cool, actually. I, although, uh, um, I'm afraid it's an example of the very thing. Now, is this? Did you mean this? It would be the kind of tricky thing he would do. At the very beginning, Hume talks about how, like, the the kind of. Um, uh aspects of human nature that make philosophers like to come up with paradoxical conclusions and their students like to believe them <laughs> so i think i wouldn't say i want to believe what hume says but i definitely like it for kind of the reason why he says like wow that's i mean who would have thought of that <laughs> anyway um uh, so there are two parts of this system. Um, one is 
the composition of extension. And I'm putting it in quotes because we're going to have to talk about exactly what counts as extension. And this is either spatial or temporal extension. out of a finite number of indivisible parts. Um, so, I mean, we already saw a version of that in Berkeley. Hume's version is slightly different, but uh, the difference is what makes it really interesting. <laughs> um, and the second part, which I guess Barclay would also agree with, um, each part is of some definite quality. And that has to be either color or solidity. Right, so each part of extension is either visible and has a color or is tangible that is has solidity. Um, heat and cold are not considered as sensible qualities that an extended thing that it extended thing can be made out of, which is a little odd. But anyway, uh, um, I don't know what else to say about that, so I'll just mention that. So it has to be either color or solidity. Um, now, um, to understand in what sense Hume means this, I have to notice right away, and this is, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say it's slightly different from Barclay. This is what makes it completely different from Barclay, that this whole section is written from the point of view that there are external objects, and the external objects are represented by our ideas. Right, so even though the treatise contains, as we'll see uh, next, uh, I guess on Wednesday, <laughs> um, the treatise contains like a really strong skeptical argument against the existence of external objects. Um, as Hume says there, and as I've mentioned before, you know, Hume doesn't think you're gonna believe the conclusions of skeptical arguments. The conclusions are not stable. Um, so consistently with that, everywhere else, Hume writes as if there are external objects, including in this section. Right, so unlike Berkeley, when we say that extension is composed of indivisible parts, we mean that the things that are represented by our ideas are composed of indivisible parts. Right. I mean, according to Berkeley, we just mean that our ideas are composed of indivisible parts. Hume thinks that too. <laughs> and in fact, he's going to use that to our, as part of his argument. But now those are two different things. Um, and on the other hand, he takes quite literally the view that our ideas represent by resembling their objects. So, um, all right, number one, our ideas represent their objects as being of some size because our ideas themselves are of some size, not necessarily the same size, and that's going to be important, but our ideas are of some size, and in that respect, they resemble their object, and that's what allows us to, to represent the object as being of some size. Um, and remember, that much Locke actually seems to agree with. Although Locke doesn't agree with the system, right? 
uh, well, Locke thinks that, ex that the that extension has to be solid, at least in one definition of extension, right? Where, where an extended thing is as opposed to empty space. So it does have to be solid, but it's not composed of indivisible parts, each one of which is itself solid, right? Locke believes that space is, and things in space are infinitely Actually, I guess, again, he doesn't say that about space. He says that about body, that is, about extended things. Locke says extended things are infinitely divisible. Um, but he, Locke does agree that we represent big something bigger by forming a bigger idea somehow. <laughs> All right. Um, but uh, the other part that Locke doesn't agree with is that our ideas represent objects as colored or solid because the ideas are colored or solid. Um, right, so in other words, like the point of view Hume is coming from in this section doesn't accept the primary secondary distinction. Um, and then, like, there's one final thing that you have to uh, have to understand to follow the argument in this section, which is that um, the only strict sense of larger Hume is arguing, taking for granted, really. Um, I mean, he has a kind of argument for it. Anyway, this, this is the view. The only strict sense of larger is containing a greater number of parts. That is, when we compare two things with respect to their size, we do it by counting their parts. Um, now, like, you might say, well, hold on a second. So here's something that has two big parts. And here's something that has three little parts. So doesn't this have more parts than this? Even though this is bigger. But you have to remember that the part whole relationship is transitive. Right, that is, all the parts of the parts are also parts of the whole. Um, so a thing can't have just two parts unless the parts are indivisible. If the parts themselves are divisible, so like this one has two parts, then each of these is also part of the whole thing. Right, so it actually has three parts. Or I guess that's how you should count it. It has four parts. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, so um, so when you say that, like the strict sense of larger than is contains a greater number of parts, you're assuming that the parts themselves are indivisible, or assuming. It turns out to mean <laughs> that either everything is infinitely large because everything contains infinitely many parts, or if if some things are larger than others, that must be because some things have more indivisible parts than others do. Um, We think that some, well, some things, we think that some infinities are larger than others, but uh, that, that doesn't really help with this issue like that, you know. The, there are as many real numbers between zero and one as there are real numbers. 
<laughs> so, uh, um, right. So anyway, getting back to the way Hume thinks about it. Um, so, uh, right, so larger than And um, the immediate consequence of this is if anything is indivisible, nothing can be smaller than that thing, right? Because if I have one, if I have an indivisible thing, then it only has one part itself. Or if you count only proper parts, it has zero parts. I don't know. But anyway, nothing can have fewer parts than that. So indiv every indivisible thing is the smallest that anything can be. And they're all the same size, namely one or zero, depending on how you count. <laughs> Josephine says, Hume versus Cantor, epic fight. Well, I mean, the, the, the truth is, I think, yeah, maybe I should say one thing before I go into the details here. Because... The arguments that, that Hume gives in this section are specific to extension. Um, um, I think that's true. Yeah, I mean, they all have to do with largeness that, that means having more parts put together, whatever that putting together is, having a kind of disposition, um, extension, well, spatial or temporal extension. So, um, um, but Hume seems to think something like this in a much more general sense. Right, like for example, remember he said that there couldn't be a, tra a continuous transition between different shades of blue. There had to be some smallest step. Um, we'll see him assuming something similar about probability in the uh, um, in in his discussion of skepticism about. Uh, um with respect to reason um it seems like he doesn't think that any quantity can be continuously varied whether it's extensive or intensive um so that would require a different type of argument than he gives you and you know and i i i think he may disagree with Cantor about what order types are conceivable, but I'm not going to say anything more about that. All right. I'm just going to talk about the argument here. So, so, so indivisible things are as small as possible. So in particular, and this is what he's going to use to prove uh, this conclusion that everything is composed out of a finite number of indivisible parts. Um, suppose some of our ideas are indivisible. Right, so remember, our ideas resemble their objects in that they too are composed of, um, or they too are extended. Right, they have some size. But we find that some of our ideas are indivisible. So we have some ideas that can't be divided into parts. Um, Hume both uh, tries to get you to do experiments or thought experiments where you can see that. 
so to speak, or feel that, I guess, although he, he only, only discusses vision when it comes to that. Um, uh, and also, I think, like, somehow tries to prove there must be. But in any case, so suppose we have an indivisible ideas. Well, so this indivisible idea is um, smaller, or there can't be anything smaller than that idea because it only has one part. Um, so therefore, the conclusion is that um, the smallest parts of our external of external things are exactly the same size as our indivisible ideas. So Hume says there can be things that are too small to see. Am I out of focus for some reason? No, no. There can be things that are too small to see, but there can't be things that are too small to imagine. That is the um, <clears throat> the limit of vision and touch in this respect is um, is due to the fact that things are much bigger than they seem, <laughs> right? So, like for example, suppose my idea of a grain of dust is indivisible. It has no parts. But suppose the grain of dust itself has millions of parts that can be seen under a microscope or whatever. So what that means is that the grain of dust is much, much bigger than the idea of the grain of dust. Right? This is the idea of the grain. And this is the grain itself. Now, I mean, okay, so this isn't really millions. It's, it's less than that, right? But however many of these it takes to fill this up. And I mean, it's weird. How do you know how many? Well, I mean, it's... Um, at this stage, we're going to see an important qualification of this. But at this stage, we're thinking like, all our ideas of size are ideas of a certain number of these in a certain disposition. <laughs> so our idea of this much is an idea of a certain number of these individual parts in a certain disposition. Um, and that's how many of these it takes to fill it up, so to speak. I mean, that's not backwards, right? What needs to be filled up is the number. <laughs> so, right, so the grain of, of dust actually is really big, right? Larger than equals have more parts. The grain of dust has more parts than the idea, so the grain of dust is bigger than the idea. And in general, like all the objects of our, sen of our senses are much bigger than they seem. But as big as they are, they can't have any parts that are smaller than this. So that's basically going to be the proof that since some ideas are indivisible, some things are indivisible. And, and in particular, that everything is composed of those indivisible things. Um. So this is just a summary. I've just given a summary, basically, of the whole argument for what for this first point. Hopefully, at the end, I'm going to have a chance to go back through it in more detail. Um, but uh, but for now, I'm going to go on to this, because there's a lot of other interesting things in this section. I'm going to talk about those. And then I'm going to come back with whatever time 
I have, at the end, uh, ex to, to go through that argument that I just outlined in more detail. Um, but, uh, um, But I, before going on, I do want to point out one um, consequence of this, which is going to uh, be important. So um, if this is true, if this is the, and Hume calls this the strict standard of, well, he calls it the strict standard of equality. It's also the strict standard of greater or less than, right? Um, Every object is either larger or smaller or exactly equal to every other object, right? Because every number is either greater or smaller or exactly equal to every other number. So um, you just have to count up the number of parts and um, uh, and uh, that's the result. Um, but in general, it can be really hard to tell which, right? That is, if I give you two little pieces of something, <laughs> um, or two big pieces of something, like two big sticks or whatever, and I ask you which one is bigger, um, and you're supposed to tell by counting the indivisible parts? Well, I mean, that's not gonna be possible, right? The indivisible parts are really small. Again, they're not too small to imagine because they're exactly the same size as our indivisible ideas, but they're too small to see. So, or feel, and they're way too small, presumably. Um, right? I mean, the microscope proves that, for example. Um, so, uh, right? Because as Hume points out, the microscope doesn't generate any new rays of light. It just spreads out the rays that were coming from the object more. Um, and so if those different rays are like showing different colors or whatever, that means that there were different colors on the object that are much too close together for us to see. And therefore they were indivisible. There's many, many indivisible parts that we can't see. So there's no way we could use this strict standard to compare the sizes of things. And even with respect to our own ideas, where in principle we could count the smallest sizes, the, the, the small indivisible parts of them. So like I have two ideas and I wanna know which one is bigger. I should be able to count the tiny parts of them. Um, uh, Hume says, and I think this is an understatement, that that's too difficult. <laughs> Right, I mean, um, uh, yeah, it's pretty hard to have what it's pretty hard to have an idea in Hume's sense that, like, I guess maybe some people can do it better than others, but that's like so stable that you could start dividing it into parts and counting them. That's you know, right? So let alone the tiny indivisible parts. <laughs> Um, so Hume says when we actually compare sizes, this is this this is the strict, this is the meaning of larger than that's relevant here, basically. Like what's larger than something else is a number. <laughs> but Hume says when we actually talk about largeness and relative largeness and smallness of things, we use a different standard, which um is he calls it the looser standard. And it's, as he puts it, derived from the whole united appearance. That's in uh, book one, chapter two, section four, 
Um, and it's on page, now let me see. I'm, I'm actually using this edition of the treatise. I used to use this for the course, but it's kind of expensive. So I switched to the other one, especially because we don't read that much of it. It didn't seem like worth it, but I wrote down the pages in your edition. So this is on page 95. Um, the only useful notion of equality or inequality is derived from the whole united appearance and the comparison of particular objects, right? So when if I ask you, you know, which is bigger, this, this pen or well, they're almost the same, aren't they? <laughs> uh, which is wider, this pen or this pen? You don't answer that question by by dividing it up into indivisible parts and counting them. You don't divide it into parts at all. You just look at it and you see that one of them is wider than the other. That's what Hume means by saying it's the whole united appearance. So what does that even have to do with this? Like, why is that a, why are those two standards of the same thing? And like, roughly speaking, it's, um, I. Hume says, I think, thinks that it's a merely empirical fact that they have anything to do with each other. And the and the, the empirical fact is that um, if you take away a big enough part of something, the whole united appearance will change so that it looks smaller than it did before. Right, so that's a connection between the loose standard and the strict standard. Because when you take away a part, now you're not taking away an indivisible part, but presumably you're taking away some number of indivisible parts. And if you take away enough, the whole united appearance will always look smaller. So there's some connection between the two, but of course it's not a pre precise connection. It can't be a precise connection because we can't count the indivisible parts. We can't see them, They're, so they don't contribute to the whole united appearance, right? And as we know that you can take away one indivisible part and the whole the whole united appearance won't change. So the, so the connection between them is, it's there, but it's not perfect. And that's why he, the this whole united appearance is called a looser standard. Okay. Are there questions about that so far? Okay, because now I'm going to go on to talk about, well, in effect, to talk about this. But, um, not about the argument for this. Maybe I should say right away that like this is somehow supposed to be a consequence of this. These small parts have no extension. So you might think they're nothing. Right, I mean, like you shouldn't think of them. Although obviously, I can't, I can't draw it this way, right? Everything I draw on the board actually does have parts. So you shouldn't think of it as as like an atom, as like a physical atom that is as something that you know you can distinguish different parts in, but you just can't break it, <laughs> right? No, it actually doesn't have any parts. Um, so. Uh, so what does it have, basically, is Hume's question, right? Like, if I have an extended thing I can uh, that I know a property that it has, namely, it has a certain number of parts. But if I'm down to only one of them, um, um, it doesn't have extension and it must have some property that makes it what it is. And Hume says, although how we know this is not so clear, 
And as I said, it's not clear why heat and cold are not on the list. But Hume says that can only be color or solidity. Only color or solidity are fit to stand in this disposition, this relation to each other that makes extension. So all these individual parts must be colored or solid. Um, okay, so that's the argument for two. But what I want to talk about is the supposed consequence of two, which is the impossibility of a vacuum. Now, I mean, I'm writing impossibility of a vacuum um, because uh, that seems to be Hume's conclusion. So this is uh, um, book one, chapter two, section five, and it's on page 40 in your text, if I wrote this down correctly. How could that be? This is really wrong. I put the whole thing I wrote down. Maybe it's in four. Oh, maybe it's in forty on mine. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, okay. It's in page one hundred two on your text. It's in forty on mine. All right. Um. If the second part of my system be true, that the idea of space or extension is nothing but the idea of visible or tangible points distributed in a certain order, it follows that we can form no idea of a vacuum or space where there is nothing visible or tangible, right? So that's the definition of vacuum here. A vacuum would be a space where there is nothing visible or tangible, but Hume says we've just, uh, proved that space is made out of parts that each of which is visible or tangible. So there can be no such thing as a vacuum. Um, however, it turns out that um, what Hume thinks is correct is actually a lot more like so to speak, it's a lot more like there is a vacuum than it is like there is no vacuum. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, um, here are two things that Hume agrees with. Um, Intervening matter. Can be a lot annihilated without uh, containing bodies coming together. Right, so like for example, the air in this room, this is the example he discusses. The air in this room, well, he doesn't discuss this room, but a room. <laughs> anyway, 
the air in this room could be annihilated, that is reduced to nothing. So there's nothing where the air was before. And yet the, the walls and the floor and the ceiling wouldn't move and wouldn't come together. Right, so Hume agrees with that. This is book one, uh, chapter two, section five, pages 110 to 11. Um, one of the things that's that's good about this edition, which maybe this is what's what you pay the extra bucks for, <laughs> is that it has all the paragraphs numbered. But your edition doesn't have the paragraphs numbered. But hopefully you could find things by looking for the page. Um, so and the second thing he agrees with this um, body can move indefinitely in a straight line. Without resistance and without anything moving out of its way, and without displacing anything. That's this page, the next page, page 21. All right. Um, so those pretty much sound like a vacuum is possible, right? Like I could annihilate the air in this room. So where the air was before, there's nothing. The sides of the room don't come together. So the nothing takes up the space that the air used to take up, so to speak. So that's a vacuum, right? And similarly here, if we say a body can move indefinitely without a, in, in a straight line. I, I mean, you have to add a straight line, right? Because even in a plenum, the opposite of a vacuum is a plenum. A vacuum just means empty and plenum means full in Latin, right? So, um, so even in a plenum, something can move indefinitely if, if it's part of a circulation, right? All these things move around. So they're all constantly moving out of the way of each other and they can keep doing that, um, which is why Descartes always explained everything who, who doesn't believe in the possibility of a vacuum, always explains everything by circulations and vortices and whatever. That's the only kind of motion there can be in his world. But, um, but if a body can move indefinitely in a straight line without encountering any resistance and without moving anything out of its way, then again, that sounds like it's moving through empty space, right? It's not hitting anything. So again, is a vacuum is possible. So how do you reconcile the impossibility of a vacuum that Hume is talking about um, at the beginning of the section and was agreeing to these things? Well, um, let me read to you again exactly what he says. And this, again, is, in, you know, I'm just going to read it from here. It follows that we can form no idea of a vacuum or space where there is nothing visible or intangible. In these two cases, he's going to deny that we have an idea of a vacuum. So what do we have when we conceive of these two cases? Like, right, you might think to conceive of the air in the room being annihilated and the walls still not touching, I would have to have an idea of the walls, an idea of the vacuum that's in between them. But Hume says we can form no idea of a vacuum. Um, 
So what's going on? He says, well, it's the absence of an idea of matter. Um, so, um, like, for example, he says, um, so remember the idea of matter. So now we understand, by the way, that the extension that's composed out of indivisible points is matter. It's body, right? And it's composed out of points that are tangible or colored or both, I guess, um, in general, both. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, um, um, Hume says, first of all, um, suppose you're in total darkness, right? So you don't see any colors. Well, I mean, unless you think black is a color, but uh, which, which Locke, we didn't read this part of Locke, but Locke in effect says, yes, we, even though, even though darkness may be the absence of light, the idea by which we represent it is something positive. But that's just what Hume is denying, right? So if there's no light at all, Hume says that um, my mind is in the same state as the mind of a, bl of a blind person. I'm not seeing anything. Right, so he's so so that what you might describe as seeing blackness everywhere, Hume says is just the absence of any visible idea or visible impression in that case, right? But then if I imagine it, it's the absence of any visible idea. Um, what does that mean? Can I just imagine it by itself? He talks as if I could, but what would that, and there's no idea. Maybe it's like the ideas of the other senses without any visible idea or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, the impression of total darkness is the same as blindness. But then he says, suppose there's two now there's two bright lights, like point like lights, like stars or whatever. Um, so Hume says, now there's two visible ideas and nothing else. <laughs> Right, and similarly, if I'm kind of like Avicenna's floating man, uh, floating in the air, not touching anything, not touching my own limbs somehow, <laughs> um, that, uh, um, that that's just the absence of any tangible sensation, any sensation of solidity. Um, Avicenna also says the air has to be like body temperature, basically. So, but again, heat and cold don't seem to enter into Hume's considerations here. Um, so, uh, um, and then if I were to feel two points touching my two fingers, I don't know, I can't do it. Um, then there would be two ideas of solidity and nothing else. So, wait, then what's this, like, isn't there something in between the two lights? 
Well, no, there's nothing in between the two bytes. And in fact, he says, this is on page 106, still this pretty much everything here is in, well, that's not true. Some of them are in section four and some are in section five. This is book one, chapter two, section five, and it's on page 106 in your edition. Um, I guess if someone is using an edition with paragraphs numbered, this is paragraph 11. Um, uh, no, that's not what I want to say. Um, okay, we may observe that when this is the bottom of 105 in yours, actually, we may observe that when two bodies present themselves, where there was formerly an entire darkness, the only change that is discoverable is in the appearance of these two objects, and that all the rest continues to be as before, a perfect negation of light and of every colored or visible object. This is not only true of what may be said to be remote from these bodies, but also of the very distance which is interposed betwixt them, that being nothing but darkness or the negation of light, without parts, without composition, invariable and indivisible. Right, so that last part is important. There isn't anything in between them. So what's in between here, first of all, is not different from what's out here, because there's nothing here or there. <laughs> it's invariable and indivisible. And second of all, like, we can't learn how long this distance is by counting its parts, because it has no parts. How can it have no parts? Doesn't everything have at least one part? Well, but it's nothing. There's nothing there. <laughs> so, um, so there are no parts. So there's nothing to count. Um, so why do we think that this is sometimes bigger and sometimes smaller? Sometimes in one direction and sometimes in another direction, so on and so forth. Well, um, it's by the whole united appearance, right? So this is a previous paragraph. I shouldn't have let this close. It's on page 105 in your edition. It's... Back to this. When two, when only two luminous bodies appear to the eye, we can perceive whether they be conjoined or separate, whether they be separated by a great or small distance. And if this distance varies, we can perceive its increase or diminution, diminution with the motion of the bodies. So we don't perceive that by counting something that's between them. It's something about that whole united appearance. Um, 
And that explains, Hume says, why we tend we form this fiction that there's an empty, there's a thing in between here that has parts. Why do we form that fiction? Well, first of all, you have to add an empirical fact. We find that there's a certain size of thing that you can move into here without changing the appearance of these two luminous bodies. Right, so again, we we tell how far apart they are from each other just by looking at them. There's something about, and I think Hume thinks that, that like it sounds, can't be further analyzed. It's just something about the way they look to us. <laughs> um, something about the way we look to us, um, which is a matter of degree but which so far has nothing to do with extension. Right, there's something about this configuration of two things that's a matter of degree, but so far has nothing to do with extension. But we learn empirically that if the two things have that appearance, then there's a certain size of visible thing that you can move into here and these two things will still have that appearance. But now there'll be something in between. And we learn that if there's two different things that you can both do that with, then, then the two, two different things will be the same size as each other. Right, again, I think Hume thinks there's no reason to, ex to expect that in advance, that there's nothing in particular about whatever this is about the appearance that somehow resembles size. Size is number of parts and there's no parts. <laughs> but, we learn that things of a certain size and only things of that size can fit exactly in this, in between these two without moving them. And from that, we start to identify this where there's nothing there with a certain size, namely the size of the thing that we know we could put in there. So uh, what kind of size is it we're talking about there? Well, of course, what we know empirically is not that, that any two things that fit in here will have the same number of indivisible parts, right? How would we know that? We never can count the number of indivisible parts that two things have. Um, even if we're talking about the idea, which I guess maybe we are at this point, but even if we're talking about the idea, that's also not how we would know, right? Because although they do have indivisible parts, we can't really count them. So when we say that the things that fit, that we say that two things that both fit in here, that is, they can both be produced in this configuration, can be created out of nothing, so to speak, in this configuration without moving these two in such a way that they'll it will touch both of them. Right? Two things that can do that are always the same size as each other. We mean by the looser standard, they're always the same size as each other. So the size of empty distances has only the looser standard. Right? The stricter standard would be, well, count the indivisible parts, but it has no indivisible parts. Or count how many indivisible parts it takes for something to exactly fit in here. But we can't, we don't know that either. We don't know if there is such a number, right? We know that all the things that fit in look about the same size. But we know that that's a loose standard. So maybe they're all different sizes. So this, so the standard of distances is only the loose standard. And you know what, what that means is that we haven't really shown that space in the sense of distance is composed of indivisible parts.
Um, the loose standard is isn't really uh, extension in the sense of number of parts in a certain disposition at all. It's some matter of degree. Um, and I think, you know, therefore, if, if Hume nevertheless thinks it's true that these things can't move continuously together or apart, that would have to be, again, because he really thinks his conclusions here or, or something similar to his conclusions here apply not only to extensive quantity, but also to intensive quantity. Um, all right. That's all I wanted to say about the vacuum. Um, other questions about that? Okay, so uh, I, like I said, I'm about to, to go back and um, discuss the argument, especially for the first thing, but also some of the weird qualifications about it that have come up um, in more detail. But, um, but first I wanted to say something about the consequences of this view for mathematics. Um, and in particular for geometry. Um, right, so remember when, was, when I was discussing the similar view in Berkeley, I went to perhaps greater length than necessary to, to show how like uh, geometry seemingly really does demonstrate that uh, lines are not made up of indivisible parts. Um, So Hume says, um, and this is book one, chapter two, section four on page 90 in your text, on page 33 in line. Um, There have been many objections drawn from the mathematics against the indivisibility of the parts of extension. And he says, though at first sight, that science seems rather favorable to the present doctrine. What's going on here? Though at first sight, that science seems rather favorable to the present doctrine. And if it be contrary in its demonstrations, it is perfectly conformable in its definitions. My present business then must be to defend the definitions and refute the demonstrations. Right? So he's going to say that um, geometry, it, that's the part of mathematics we're talking about here, right? He's going to say that geometry um, uh, starts from correct definitions, for example, of line, point, et cetera. By line here, he means not what he calls right line or what we would call straight line or what in geometry, we now just usually call a line. By line, he means what we would call a curve. Um, right, so the mathematics starts with the right definitions, but something goes wrong in the demonstrations, right? So like, we got to that demonstration that this line was square root of two times this line, and therefore 
couldn't be composed of simple parts that could be used to compose that one. Uh, Hume is going to say something went wrong in the demonstration. But of course, you know, like Barclay, uh, he's not going to claim that there's some uh, mistake in some particular step of the demonstration. Right? It's not like he's going to say, oh, wait, you didn't notice that angle is not congruent to that angle. Because, right? I mean, there's no mistakes like that in, you know, in. Uh, this kind of demonstration, right? Uh, you know, people have been going over it for thousands of years. So that's not what he means. Um, but rather, uh, so this is how he explains it. So this is on page 93 in your book and on page 34 and mine. Uh, with regard to such minute objects that is of um, indivisible points, they are not properly demonstrations being built on ideas which are not exact and maxims which are not precisely true. So um, the maxims, maxims means basically the axioms of geometry. The definitions are right. So what are the, what are the definitions he's talking about? So he says like, if we define a point as something that has neither length, breadth, nor depth, <laughs> whatever the third one is, um, then he says, that makes sense according to my system, right? Something that has neither length, breadth or depth is an indivisible thing. And if you say, well, that's nothing, I say, no, it's not. It has a color or it's, it's solid. It's something, it's just not expanding. So, um, so Hume says, I can make sense of that definition. On the other hand, the mathematicians, uh, when they say that extension is infinitely divisible, have to say that um, there's nothing that has neither the length, breadth, or depth, because everything is divisible, right? So, um, uh, you know, and similarly, if they define a line as something that has length, but not breadth or depth, um, Hume says that makes sense according to me. It's one indivisible part across, <laughs> right? But according to them, it doesn't make any sense. According to them, this line is nothing, and so forth. Right. But he says the axioms, the maxims. Um, so, I mean, um, I don't know which one we think is only approximately true here, but maybe something like there's always a line between any two points. Um, maybe there isn't really a line that fits exactly between the two corners of this square. It's something like that. Um, one of the axioms is approximately true, but it's not precisely true. And, um, and Hume thinks that uh, we've sort of, we've sort of speak, it, it's not even so much that these axioms are wrong, it's that we've misinterpreted them. 
And we misinterpreted them because um, we didn't realize that geometry is op can't be operating with the strict or just standard of greater, less, and equal. Because again, we can't count the indivisible parts of things. So it's it's operating with the loose standard. And the loose standard, no one ever said it was precise, anything you could say about it, right? So in other words, um, we know there are things that look the same length as the distance between these two points. That is, you know, they look like they can fit in here with, and these points are moved and they touch these points. But, um, yeah, that's exactly the right way to put it. Maybe I should say there's some way of joining these points, but what's approximate is that these two triangles are congruent to each other. What we know is that they look the same size as each other, but we don't know that they really have the same number of indivisible points in their sides. We're not even talking about that. Geometry is not about that. Um. So, you know, what we conclude is that this square looks like it has twice the area of this square, right? based on the whole appearance. But um, um, that doesn't impl imply that whatever number of points there are here, its square is twice whatever number of parts there, points there are here. Because the correlation between the loose standard and a strict or just standard is just loose, <laughs> right? So there's no such implication. Um, so the, the conclusion, which was that, that these things must be infinitely divisible, because otherwise you would have this for two natural numbers, which is impossible, right? Because then n over m would be the square root of two, or yeah, n over n would be the square root of two. Um, uh, really, the real theorem that you can prove on the, based on the real axioms by, if you understand them properly, just doesn't imply that. So it doesn't imply infinite divisibility. Um, so what Hume thinks about geometry is a little bit different than what Barclay thinks about geometry because Barclay doesn't bring in this loose standard thing, I think. So like Barclay claims that mathematics consists of correct deductions from principles that are false. Ray, they, the axioms are always a little bit off in any given case. And therefore, although we, we mathematicians deduce things from them correctly, the result is wrong because the axiom was false. Whereas Humes thinks that um, the, um, the axioms and the conclusions are true uh, if they're interpreted correctly, but we get these paradoxical uh, results like infinite divisibility, which he thinks is highly paradoxical. Um, we get these paradoxical results uh, 
because we imagine that we have a strict standard, that we can correct the loose standard until it precisely corresponds with the strict standard. And, and actually that's impossible. Okay. How much time? No, oh, I have some time. Other questions? I just erased it, but other questions about geometry? About the distinction I just drew between Hume and Barclay on this? What would he say to someone who just says, live with the paradox? Well, I mean, it's a good question because that's sometimes what Hume himself tells us. Right, that, in effect, that's what he's gonna tell us. I mean, it's not even advice, really. It's just a prediction, right? He says, he, he's gonna say, you can't get out of this paradox, so you're going to live with it, right? It's like, um, uh, so, uh, you know, why not say that here? Um, I think he would say, well, there's no reason to do that if I can show you uh, that the paradox is a mistake. I don't know if there's any more to it than that. I mean, he does say some things in the course of this that sound inconsistent with what he says in other places. And maybe even somewhere there is a clue to why he changed his mind by the time he wrote the inquiry. Um, like he says, you know, um, when it comes to demonstrations, uh, it doesn't make sense to offer different to to say that something is a difficulty that you you don't know how to deal with, but that um, you're leaving it aside for now because the demonstration is right or something like that. Like he says, you know. Either the demonstration is right, in which case there are no difficulties, or the demonstration is wrong. Can't be both. Um, but um, the truth is, he himself in this very section makes a move that like shows why maybe that's not right, where he says, like, um, you know, before I go into all the details of the mathematician's argument, we can see in advance that none of these are going to be any good because here's a proof that what they're showing is impossible is actually what they're claiming to show is impossible is actually possible. So, like, uh, um, he does think it makes sense sometimes to say, well, like, I already know X is true, so I'm not even interested in the details of your proof that not X. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's all I can say about that. He, he, he just, like, if we couldn't resolve the paradox, we would have to live with it. And maybe that is what he thinks about it in the inquiry, actually. I think that it is what he thinks about it in the inquiry. He, he doesn't go over to say that the idea of infinite divisibility makes sense in the inquiry, but he does seem to go over into the idea that geometry is precise. And now, you know, obviously there's a problem. And um, he may, his, his response to it may be, well, live with the paradox. Okay, anyway, good question, but that's all I have to say about it. All right, let me go back to, uh, the argument for the first part of the system, the indivisibility of the parts of extension. So it has basically four steps. 
So the the first step is um, the finitude of Right, he says, like, all our ideas are only finitely complex. And he says that's universally allowed because we're like finite beings. We don't have the ability to entertain infinitely complicated ideas. Um, Now, I mean, is it universally allowed? I think uh, I mean, for one thing, it's not really allowed by Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz says we we have infinitely complex ideas, but they're confused. That's the measure of our finitude. Um, I don't know if that's. Um, if that's a problem with Hume's argument, or if that might be a, a way of another way of saying the same thing. But in any case, but like, I mean, you might allow that our ideas are infinitely complex because in the sense that they represent an object that's infinitely complex without being infinitely complex themselves, right? So it's uh, like, again, the thought here is that an idea represents its object by resembling it. Um, so, um, so if that's true, if an idea can represent its uh, right, in other words, like if you think that my idea represents kind of like the way a mathematical formula represents or something like that, you might imagine that my idea has very few parts, but it somehow represents something as having infinitely many parts. Um, uh, I don't know, maybe that's not relevant. It depends what you mean by the finite complexity of an idea. In any case, right, so if an idea can only have finitely many distinct parts, then again, since as I said before, the part-whole relation is transitive, um, uh, Every idea has to have parts that don't have parts, right? If it had no parts that, that, that had no parts, then it would have infinitely many parts because here's one of its parts. Here's one of the parts of its parts. Here's one of the parts of the parts of its parts, et cetera. And you can keep going forever. So there's infinitely many parts. <laughs> Because all again, because it's transitive, all of these parts of parts of parts are parts of the original whole. So, um, so, um, Right, so therefore it has it has uh, has therefore they have indivisible parts. And then the second step is to conclude from this that the imagination reaches a minimum. 
This is uh, page 76. The imagination reaches a minimum. And again, this is because, um, um, strictly speaking, bigger than equals having more parts. So nothing can be smaller than anything that is indivisible. And um, well, I'll just read this. It's on page 77. Nothing can be more minute than some ideas which we form in the fancy. Some ideas which we form in the fancy and images which appear to the senses, since these are ideas and images perfectly simple and indivisible, right? So there's some ideas and impressions that are indivisible. Now, again, like it's a little weird, although he does go into these ex actual or thought experiments by which you can kind of um, become conscious of the indivisible parts. It's like the main point is an argument that there must be such parts because our ideas are finitely complex, right? So this is like a demonstration from first principles rather than empirical, it appears. We show that there, there must be indivisible parts. And then we conclude that since there are indivisible parts um, uh, of ideas, there are um, things of minimum size, namely those indivisible parts of ideas. So from that we conclude that that not only does the imagination reach a minimum, but there's a minimum in nature, right? Because um, because although um, it's, we have no reason to think and Hume thinks it's not true that um, the smallest external things we can see or touch um, are smaller than any other object, right? That's not true. Like there's small dust grains that we can see, but they're much bigger than other things that we can't see. So it's not true that the smallest external things we can see or touch are smaller than anything. But it's true that the smallest internal things, that is the smallest impressions and ideas that we have, are smaller than anything else, whether external or internal. And we know that for sure because they're indivisible, so nothing can be smaller than them. Right, so I mean, of course, like uh, Barclay wouldn't put it that way. I mean, it's not exactly he would disagree with the conclusion. He would disagree that there's any difference here, right? I mean, he would say that the smallest things we can see or touch are the smallest things in nature. Right, and so that's why he says, for example, there is no such thing as the 10,000th part of an inch. And then if you ask him, what about the microscope? Well, he'll say, you know, um, um, it's a regularity, like a law of nature, that if you take the smallest possible thing and you put it 
under a lens. But I mean, when you say put it under a lens, and actually it's not just one lens, it's a whole complicated thing, right? But when you put it under a lens, let's say it's a magnifying glass rather than a microscope. And uh, um, of course, put it under a lens means that certain ideas do certain things, right? Um, when that happens, it will be followed by the idea of a bigger thing seen through the lens. End of story, right? Um, and, you know, I mean, uh, if we were to accept the skeptical conclusion, but Hume says we can't, <laughs> that he draws later, then uh, Hume would have to say the same thing. But, uh, right, so in other words, Barclay would say, if you ask Hume, what happens when I take something barely big enough to see and I divide it, and now I don't see anything. Hume says, well, there are still parts left that are too small for you to see. Well, Barclay says, it's gone. <laughs> There's nothing left. Um, all right. Although there may be a regularity that if you take a magnifying glass, it will come back. <laughs> OK. Um, So you might think, you know, we're done, right? There's a minimum in nature. That means things in nature are not infinitely divisible. But you have to add here that um, uh, things in nature are not infinitely big. Right? I mean, we know Hume is conceding that they're much bigger than their ideas of them. So why not infinitely bigger than ideas of them? Right? So like maybe the grain of dust, even though it's represented by this one indivisible idea in me, is not just a million times bigger than it, but infinitely bigger than it. So, um, they only have one minute left. I'm just going to compress what I have to say about this. Because I think uh, Hume's answer to this is. So Hume's answer to this is, roughly speaking, without going into the details, similar to Barclay's um, uh, objection that infinitely large things wouldn't have shapes, right? And also Hume adds that one of them wouldn't be bigger than another one, right? They would all be infinitely large. Um, but And because they didn't have limits, they wouldn't have shapes. So, um, right, so therefore they're not infinitely large. Therefore they have a finite number of parts and therefore they're composed of a finite number of indivisible uh, parts, which is what we wanted to show. Um, but there's something weird about this because, I mean, Leaving aside the question about like order types and whatever, whether there's actually a way to make a finite thing out of an infinite number of parts. Um, maybe I'm not leaving that aside exactly, but in any case, like the this argument would seem to work if when we judge that some things are larger than others or that some things have one shape and some things have another shape. We did it by observing the number and order of their indivisible parts. So then we'd say, if they were infinitely many, we couldn't do it. So things wouldn't have shapes and they wouldn't have different sizes relative to each other. But Hume agrees that we don't do it that way. So in other words, like when we say, well, this pen looks only finitely large, <laughs> 
we don't mean it looks like it has finitely many indivisible parts. It's something we gather from the whole appearance. Maybe infinitely large things in the strict sense can be, uh, as far as their whole appearance goes, can be of different sizes and shapes and everything. So it's, um, it's not clear because of problems about this step, it's not clear in the end that this proof works. Again, uh, maybe Hume, maybe that's one of the things Hume noticed when he changed his mind before he wrote the inquiry. I don't know. In any case, uh, time is up. So I will see you on Wednesday via Zoom again, and we'll talk about skepticism. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.